I apologize for the short update, guys. Things have gotten a little crazy around here, and I'm not sure how often I'll be able to update going forward. I really appreciate all the support you guys have given me. And while I only have a couple of stories to share with you, I'll be interested to see what you all think. A firefighter who was helping us at the training up told me about a call he'd gone on, supposedly to help rescue a kid from an absolutely massive tree. He said they didn't give him details, just that they needed him to come out and help because they lacked the proper equipment. He'd been called out specifically because this thing was so huge that the SARs didn't feel very safe trying to climb it. He'd been a tree trimmer before joining the VFD, so it was easy enough for him to grab his old equipment and come help out. He was let out about two miles, and the team stopped at one of the biggest trees in the area and pointed up. He laughed and asked the op captain how the kid had gotten up there, made some joke about the old cat in a tree thing. But the captain just shook his head and told him to get up there and get the kid down. He said he knew something was up, but he didn't push it. He said that as he climbed this tree, he started wondering if they were playing a prank on him. There was no way this kid should have been able to climb this fucking tree. It was massive at the base, but about halfway up, it started tapering, and I almost had to turn back a few times because I didn't really think it was going to hold me. But he said he kept going, and when he was just about at the top, he saw a flash of blue in the branches. I saw the kid's shirt sort of caught in a branch, and I called out to him and told him to come near me if he could. But he didn't say anything. I kept moving, calling the kid's name and telling him not to be scared, that I was there to help him. By the time I got to him, I knew he wasn't going to answer me. I found him, or what was left of him, cradled in the fork of a branch. And the fact that he was up there was sheer luck. If he'd fallen any other way, he'd have come crashing down. It wouldn't have mattered though, because this kid was dead long before he ended up in that tree. I don't know who put him there, or how, or why, but it was fucking sick. Kid's intestines had popped out of his mouth and were hanging in the branches. It was like some sick fucking Christmas tree, the way they were draped all over everything. I got a better look and saw it even popped out of his ass. His guts were hanging out of the bottom of his pants. His eyes were gone. I assumed shoved out from whatever force caused him to fucking pop like a stress ball. You ever seen a body that's been floating in water for a long time? How their tongues kind of swell up and stick out? His was like that. I remember because there were flies crawling all over it. I think I must have gone into shock because, man, I just pushed that kid down with a stick. I broke off a branch just sort of poked him until he fell. I almost lost my job because of that. But the thought of hauling that kid down over my shoulder the whole way, gathering his guts up and coiling them around me like rope so they wouldn't get snacked, I couldn't do it. I've seen a lot of dead kids, more than I'd ever admit. I've seen a kid who hid in a full bathtub during a house fire, boiled them alive, turned them into literal soup. But this... I don't know what did this, but the thought of touching that kid's body made me feel like I was going to lose my mind. I heard him hit the ground and I figured everyone would freak out. But they knew he was dead when they sent me up there. They didn't say anything, but they didn't shout or freak out or anything. I got to the bottom and I started to get up in the captain's face, asking him who he thought he was, sending me up there when they knew damn well the kid was dead. But he just told me, it was none of my concern, and thanked me for getting the evidence down. I remember he said that. I remember it specifically, because it was so weird to hear it phrased that way. The evidence. Like he wasn't even a person. Like he'd never been a little kid who got lost, and had something fucking unspeakable happen to him. The captain had a crew let me back out of the woods. But he and two others stayed behind, and I thought that was weird. Why wouldn't they have me help the kid get out? I tried asking, but the guys leading me out just told me they couldn't discuss an open case. I asked them what he thought had happened to the kid, and he got really pensive and thought about it for a bit. I would have said a crush injury, based on how his guts came out like that. 
But with those injuries, you see massive contusions under the skin. Obvious trauma. This wasn't like that. It was almost like that kid got caught in a big vacuum and had his guts sucked out. But even then, there was no trauma. None at all. It bothers me, man. It bothers the hell out of me. One of the vets at the training op reads No Sleep, and he recognized my stories. He knows me pretty well, and we have swapped stories before. He asked if he could share something he'd noticed about the stairs, and some thoughts he had. I'm really glad you decided to share these. I think it's important that people be aware of what's out there, especially since the Forest Service is doing such a good job at covering it all up. I asked what he meant. What do you mean? What do you mean, what do I mean? The lack of any kind of media attention? No coverage of missing kids or bodies found miles from where they got lost in the first place? David Politis hit this right on the head. The FS is doing everything they can to keep people coming here. Even if it isn't safe. I mean, to be fair, it's not like these things happen every day. But the numbers add up and worth looking into. Especially the stairs. I was surprised you didn't mention the flipped ones. I didn't know what he was talking about. I couldn't remember him ever talking about something like that. He seemed somewhat incredulous. Dude, I can't believe you've been on this long without seeing them. No one told you about them? I shrugged and asked them to elaborate. Well, there's the normal stairs. The ones that pop up when we're out of ways. I know you know about them, but sometimes I've run across ones that are flipped upside down. I guess it would be like if you had a dollhouse and the stairs were a separate piece. Now take that, flip it upside down so the top step is stuck in the dirt and put it out in the woods. They're like that. I don't see them often, but they are odd to say the least. Makes me think of footage taken after a tornado, when houses are blown apart and random things are left standing, like chimneys and garden walls. Those ones freak me out more than the normal ones, because I can't really write those off as easily. I don't scare very easily, like most of us who work out here, but that idea stuck with me, and it bothers me. I'm going to try and find out more about them. He also mentioned how many people were bothered by the guy with no face. He got really excited and told me he'd seen something similar. I was out on a training exercise a few years ago. I was camped out in my tent and I heard someone walking around outside of camp. We're told not to wander far, which you know, so I wondered if maybe it was a rookie who'd gotten up to pee and couldn't find his way back. Remember that guy in our group a few years back? who almost fell off that damn mountain? Well, I'm paranoid about that happening again, so I got up to see what was going on. I went to the edge of camp, and I called to whoever it was and told them that camp was this way, but they kept going back out into the woods. So I went after them. I know it was stupid, but I was half asleep, and I just really didn't want to deal with some idiot getting hurt. I followed this thing on a dead straight course for about a mile, and then it stopped on the edge of a little river. I could see the outline of it because the water was reflecting the moon, and it looked just like an ordinary guy. He had a pack on, and it looked like he was facing me. I asked if he was okay, if he needed help, and he cocked his head like he didn't understand me. I always have my pocket knife on me, and it's got a little thumb light attached to it. So I turned that on and lit up his chest so I wouldn't blind him. He was breathing slow and deep, so I wondered if he was sleepwalking. I went closer and asked him again if it was okay. I moved the light up, and something didn't seem right, so I stopped. He kept breathing in this real slow deep breaths, and I sort of figured out gradually that that's what was bothering me. He was pretending to breathe, but not actually doing it. His breaths were too even and deep, and all his movements were exaggerated, like his shoulders going up and his chest moving. I told him to identify himself, and he made this muffled noise. I moved the light up, and I shit you not. 
this guy had no face, just smooth skin. I freaked out and sort of fumbled my light, but I saw him move toward me, but he didn't actually move. I don't know how to explain it, but one second he was at the edge of the river, and the next he was five feet from me. I never looked away or blinked. It was like he moved so fast, my brain couldn't keep up. I tripped and fell on my ass, and I could see this line open up on his throat. It stretched up to his ears, and his head tilted back, and he smiled at me with his throat. There wasn't any blood, just this gaping dark hole. And I swear, he smiled at me with this gash in his throat. I got up, and I ran as fast as I could back to camp. I couldn't hear him following me, but I felt like he was always right behind me. Even though when I looked back, I couldn't see him. I calmed down when I got back to camp. The fire was still going, and I guess that back mentality of being with other people made me stop and breathe a little. I waited by the fire to see if it followed me there, but I didn't hear anything else for a few hours. So, I went back to bed. I know it sounds weird, but the whole thing was just so surreal that it was almost like I immediately wrote it off as my imagination. We were telling ghost stories one night just to scare each other and poke fun at whoever got creeped out. Most of the time, it's the rookies. But one woman told a story that actually managed to get under my skin a little, and I know the same was true for the others. She said it was true. But then again, every ghost story told around a campfire is true. Somehow though, I don't think she was making it up. It had that ring of truth that only traumatizing events have. She said that, when she was a kid, she and her friends used to go out in the woods behind her house a lot. She lived in northern Maine, where there's a lot of dense, unpopulated national forest. She said the woods up there aren't like they are here. They're so thick in places that the trees block out the sun almost completely. She and her friend grew up there, so they weren't scared of being out there alone. But they did maintain a sense of caution in certain areas. She said... It was never really talked about, but they always knew not to go more than a mile or two beyond their homes. The adults never said why, but it was an unspoken rule that no one ventured out that far. She and her friend made up stories about bears as big as houses that lived out there, and they used to scare each other by hiding and making growling noises while the others searched for them. She said one summer, there was a series of awful storms that blew down a lot of trees and set one part of the forest, a few miles behind her house, on fire. Fire crews got it under control, but she said some of them came back not quite the same. It was like they'd been to war. You could tell who's really gotten scared because they had the same look on their faces. I think it's called shell shock. My friend and I said they were like walking dead people. They didn't smile or say anything if you went up to them and most of them left town as soon as everything was over. I asked my parents about it, but they said they didn't know what I was talking about. Once everyone got told the woods were safe again, my friend and I decided to try and hike out to where the fire had been. We didn't tell our parents where we were going, and it was pretty exciting to think that we were disobeying them like that. We hiked out about two miles or so, and we started seeing burnt trees and stuff. I remember my friend got really upset because we found the skeleton of a deer curled up under a tree, and I practically had to drag her away. She wanted to bury it, but I didn't want her touching it because its antlers were weird. I can't remember why. I just remember thinking that there was something wrong with them, and I didn't want either of us going near it. The farther we went, the more burnt everything got. Eventually, there were no standing trees, and it was like being on another planet. Almost nothing green, just brown and black everywhere. We were standing there looking at it all, and we both heard someone shouting in the distance. I panicked because I thought it was my dad, and that he was going to tell me that I was grounded. My friend broke off and went to hide behind a big rock, because she said she didn't want to be caught out here. Her parents had forbidden her to come out in the woods at all, and she had lied and told them we were going to a movie. I followed her, and we kept listening. 
I could hear this voice getting closer, and I realized they were calling for help. I thought maybe it was some hiker who had gotten lost and needed directions back to town. That used to happen all the time, so I was used to helping people out. I heard him following my voice, so I kept calling out until I saw him running in the distance. He got closer, and I could see that his face was all red. I told my friend to give me her pack, because she had a first aid kit. She made this noise like she was grossed out, and asked if I saw his face. I told her to shut up, and I jogged up to meet him. I stopped about halfway, and when he stopped in front of me, I could see that his nose and lips and part of his forehead were all gone. It was like they'd been sliced clean off. He was bleeding bad, and I saw that the knees of his pants were red too. I took a step back, but I was too scared to move much, and he grabbed my shoulders. It felt like I got a shock, and he jerked back. He started babbling, and I couldn't tell what he was saying, except that he kept asking how long he'd been gone. He looked to me. He asked me where his unit was. But I just shook my head. He looked me over, and he saw my Walkman, and he screamed. He just kept babbling and touching his face, and I realized he wasn't wearing the right clothing. He had some kind of weird gray cloth jacket and almost formal pants on, and the jacket had these weird buttons and red borders on it. I kept shaking my head, and I told him I couldn't understand what he was saying. I went to open the first aid kit, but he just screamed again and said the only thing I could really understand. Don't touch me. You'll make me go back there. After that, he ran off, and I could hear him screaming the whole time. When I couldn't hear him anymore, I turned around, and my friend was crying. I just turned around and started walking back toward town. She asked me over and over what had happened and who that was, but I didn't say anything. When we got home, I told her I didn't want to play in the woods with her anymore. We're still friends, but we don't talk about that guy. Not ever. I'll update as soon as I'm able, guys. I appreciate the continued support. It's been way too long since I posted an update, and I'm sorry about that. There's also been some confusion about the new formatting requirement on the board, which I've cleared up. So, these next few stories are going to be posted a little differently. They'll be in chronological order, and I'll do my best to tie them into each other as much as I can so it doesn't skip around too much. When I started out as a rookie, no one had told me a lot about the job in terms of weird things that could happen. I'm assuming this was largely to prevent me from freaking out and abandoning the park. But a few months into my service, when I was still a rookie, a friend and I were drunk at a party, and he opened up a bit. Yeah, it can get a little crazy out there, I guess. I think the worst are the ones where people die when they just shouldn't, you know? Or when we find them dead like 10 minutes after someone says they saw them last. They were fine when I passed them on the switchback, I swear. That sort of shit. Like, take this guy who I found one spring out on a really popular trail. Someone comes into the VC, freaking about some guy who's lying in the middle of the path in this giant pool of blood. So we run out there, and we find this guy dead as a doornail, which he absolutely should be, because the back of his head is like mashed potatoes. The skull is decimated, brains are leaking out like custard filling. And the guy's old, so you figure yeah, he probably fell and hit his head. Old people fall all the time. It's no big deal. Except that this area where he fell doesn't have any big rocks. There's not even any stumps or big branches. And on top of that, there's no blood trail, so he clearly died where he dropped. Now that's when you turn to murder. But there were people just out of line of sight with the guy. If someone came up behind him and murdered him, there's no way someone wouldn't have hurt. And again, even if someone had, there'd be a blood trail spatter all over the place. But everyone on the scene said it looked exactly like he'd fallen and smashed his head on a rock. So, what the fuck did he hit his head on? 
And then, there was this lady I found in a different park about five years ago, back when I was upstate. We found her in the middle of a stand of big junipers, curled around the trunk like she was hugging it. We pick her up to move her, and a fucking waterfall comes out of her mouth, splashes all over my shoes. Her clothes are dry, and her hair is dry, but the amount of water in her lungs and stomach was phenomenal. Unreal, man. Coroner's report? Says the cause of death was drowning. Her lungs were completely full of water. This, even though we're in the middle of the high desert, and there isn't a body of water for miles. No nothing. No signs of anyone else being out there. I mean, yeah, it's possible they were murdered. But why go out of the way to do it like that? Why not just stab them and be done with it? I don't know. It just sits weird with me. Now, of course, that freaked me out a little. But we were wasted. And I guess I sort of wrote it off as a fluke. I also assumed there was exaggeration there. Since, you know, we were wasted. Now, I don't like talking about this next case very much. It was an awful one that I've done my best to forget about. But of course, that's easier said than done. This happened about six months after the conversation with my friend at the bar. And up until that point, I hadn't had a lot of weird shit go down. A few things here and there. And of course, the stairs. But it's amazingly easy to get used to stuff like that when it's treated as if it's normal. This case was a little different. A guy with Down's syndrome in his 20s went missing after his family lost sight of him on a major path. That was odd in and of itself, because this guy never left his mom's side. She was absolutely convinced he'd been kidnapped, and unfortunately, a ranger who isn't with the park anymore insinuated that no one was going to kidnap someone. Well, with that kind of disability, not very tactful to say the least. We wasted a lot of time trying to calm her down enough to get information about him, and then we put out an official missing persons call. Because of the urgency of the situation, him being mostly unable to function alone, we had local police come in and help us. We didn't find him the first night, which was heartbreaking. None of us wanted to think of him being alone out there. We assumed he just kept wandering and was staying ahead of us. We brought out Hellies the next day and they spotted him in a little canyon. I helped bring him back up, but he was in bad shape, and I think we all knew he wasn't going to make it. He'd fallen and broken his spine and couldn't feel his lower half. He'd also broken both his legs, one at the femur, and he'd lost a lot of blood. He was confused and scared while he was alone, so he'd probably exacerbated the injuries by dragging himself a little ways. I know it sounds awful, but while I was riding in the copter with him, I asked him why he'd wander off. I just wanted something to tell his mother, to let her know it wasn't her fault, because he was fading fast, and I didn't think she'd get to ask him herself. He was crying, and said something about how the little sad boy had wanted him to come play. He said the little boy wanted to trade, so he could go home. Then he closed his eyes, and when he woke up again, he was in the canyon. I'm not sure that's exactly what he said, but it was what I thought the gist of it was. He kept crying, asking where his mommy was, and I held his hand and tried my best to keep him calm. It was cold out there. He kept saying that. It was cold out there. My legs was frozen. It was cold out there. It's cold in me. He was getting even weaker, so he eventually stopped talking, and he closed his eyes for a while. Then, when we were about five minutes from the hospital, he looked right at me, with these big tears running down his face, and he said, Mama won't see me no more. Love Mama. Wish she was here. And he closed his eyes and he just never woke up. It was horrible and I don't like talking about it. That case was one of the first ones that really rattled me badly. Because of how badly it affected me, I reached out to a senior ranger and who ended up helping me through it. As time went on, 
and we got to know each other better, he ended up sharing one of his own stories with me. It was disturbing, but it helped to know that I wasn't the only one affected by the things going on out there. I think this must have happened before you got here, because I think if it had happened while you were here, you'd have remembered it. I know it didn't end up in the news for some reason, but I think most people who've been here long enough know about it. The park sold off a portion of land to a logging company, and it was a really controversial thing. But it wasn't that large or old of a plot, and it was right after the recession, so we needed cash bad. Anyway, they were felling this plot of land, and we get a call that we need to get our supervisors out right away. I don't know why, but they ended up sending me and a few other guys along with the hits. I guess for power in numbers to see what was up. We got there, and all these guys are crowded around a tree that they've just cut down. They're all pissed off and freaking out, and the foreman comes over and says he wants to know what we think we're up to. What the hell you think this is? Some kind of sick joke? You've got a lot of fucking nerve pulling this shit. We bought this land fair and square. Well, we don't know what the hell he's talking about. So he brings us over to this felled tree and points at it and tells us that when they cut it down, it was just like this, and they'll be damned if they put it there. The inside of the tree was all rotted out and hollow in one spot, and when they cut it down, it had exposed that chamber, and inside it is a hand, like a perfectly severed hand, and looks like it's actually fused with the inside of the tree. Well, now we think they're pulling a joke, so we tell them that we don't like being fucked with, and we start to leave. But they tell us they've already called the cops, and that they'll go right to the media if we don't stick around. Well, that gets the hit's attention, so they stick around and talk to the police about it. Everyone is denying that they put the hand in there. And besides, how would anyone have even done it? It's clearly a real hand, but it's not mummified or skeletal. It's brand new, probably not even a day old, and it is definitely fused with the wood. You can see that it's coming right out of it. The loggers, they insist that they didn't put it there. Somehow, this fresh human hand ended up fused to the inside of this living tree. The cops have them cut up that section of tree into a movable chunk. Then, they take the hand away, and the area is closed off. There was a pretty big investigation, but I know they didn't find any answers. Now it's become this legend... And as far as I know, we haven't sold any more property for logging. As you all know, I went to a training seminar recently and heard some amazing and horrible things there. One of the guys I talked to while I was there told me a story when we were all around the campfire one night. We were both pretty drunk, you'll see a pattern here, and we were swapping stories. He told me this one, me and another guy were out on a field search because some campers reported screaming noises at night, so we head out there to look for whatever fucking mountain lion has wandered into the area. And I'm pissed. We've had three of them show up in the camping areas that year alone, and I'm getting tired as hell of constantly having to deal with them. Plus, I just don't like them anyway. They're a pain in the ass, and they're loud, and they scare the shit out of me. Fucking cats. Pieces of shit. I'm groaning about it to the guy I'm with, and he thinks it's a real fucking riot. So, we're seeing all these broken branches, and what look like dens, and we're pretty sure we know where this thing is. I call in, and they tell me to confirm if possible, which you know just means they want you to step into a big pile of shit and use that as proof. I'm not seeing any though, so I basically just tell them to shove it. I'm done. We know that damn thing's out here somewhere even if I'm not stepping in its shit or inside its mouth or whatever. And guy I'm with wanders off to take a piss or whatever, and I stay behind watching this little burrow under a tree to see if maybe a fox or something is living under it, cause I love foxes, man. They're cute as hell. But anyway, I'm watching this tree, and I start hearing branches crackling, and it's coming from the direction my partner went opposite of. Now, I've got my pistol. But you and I both know, that's not gonna do shit against the cat. I cock it and holler for my partner to get his dumbass back. But he's too far, and he can't hear me. 
I stand up and get my sights on where the thing is approaching. And I shit you not, man, I just about beat myself. This guy is coming toward me. And he's backflipping through the fucking woods. Like instead of walking, he's doing these crazy fucking backflips. And I swear to God, he cleared every fucking log and bush in his path. It was like he knew right where he was going. I yell at the guy to stop right where he is. That I'm pointing a gun right at him. But he keeps coming. And I just kinda lost it. I shot at the ground in front of him. And it was a dumb fucking thing to do. But man, I didn't want this guy anywhere near me. When I fired, he was about 50 yards from me. And as soon as the gun goes off, he whirls around and goes off, back flipping back into the woods. My partner hears my gun go off and runs back and asks what's up. And I tell him that there's some fucking weirdo out here, hopped up on god knows what, and we need to get the hell out of Dodge. I let the cops know what happened, and I didn't get in any trouble for firing. But man, I don't know what that motherfucker was on, but I've never seen anything like that before. Shit was absolutely buttfuck crazy. I think we can agree that there's stuff going on out here in the woods. And while I'm not going to spout off about what it could be or offer any theories, what I want people to take away from all of this is that it is so damn important to be safe when you're out there. I know a lot of you think you're invincible, but the fact is that you can die out there or be hurt or go missing. It's easier than you'd ever imagine. I apologize for this relatively short update, guys. I will do my best to continue this series as soon as possible. Thanks for all your continuing support. It means the world to me. One of the topics that I get asked a lot about here and in real life involve things like the rake, the wendigo, and other related legends. I can't honestly say that I know a lot about any of them, but based on some light reading I did, I can say that I've heard stories that seem to be loosely related to them. You've heard the old adage that legends like that come from somewhere, and I'm sure that's true. But as you all know, I do try to take things with a grain of salt. You have to out here. It's sort of like working in a hospital I'd imagine. You could spend all day thinking about how many people have died there and how there are probably ghosts, or whatever you want to call them, all over the place. But it doesn't do you any good. It just makes it harder to do your job. I think a lot of us feel that way, and that's why we try to just go about our work like everything is fine. Once you get paranoid, there's not really any going back, and a lot of cadets quit because of it. My park especially seems to have a high turnover rate, because the cadets graduate and get so freaked out about everything and they can't seem to let it go. You have to learn to internalize things and shut off. I've talked to KD a bit about her experience because I wanted to know what she thought about the Wendigo. She didn't really have anything in particular to say about it, aside from that she didn't want to think about it that much. But she told me a friend of hers had had something similar happen. I contacted this person, H, over Skype and they agree to talk to me a bit. They're aware of my work here, and they're fine with me posting the story exactly as they wrote it. I grew up in central Oregon, and there's a reservation called Warm Springs about two or so hours from where I lived. I only mention that because a lot of people in my area have friends there, and a lot of the land in that area belongs to that tribe. When I was a kid, we used to go camping up there. Not on the rest, of course, but in that area, and I met a lot of kids who grew up there. I got to know one kid really well. His name was Nolan, and we ended up hanging out a lot when our families were in the area. Our folks got to know each other, so we'd all get in touch and camp out there at the same time. We'd camp for about two weeks, so we were out there for a long time. I asked them if he camped in an RV. Yeah, my dad had one. So, I guess it wasn't really camping, but we'd take our tents and stuff and set them up, out away from the camp, most nights. I didn't like sleeping in there because I liked being outside. We talked for a bit about camping. So anyway, sorry. One year, Nolan and I were out there. 
I think we must have been like 12 or so. We wanted to go out and camp near the river because we wanted to try night fishing. I think we must have been about a third of a mile from the main camp, far away enough that we couldn't hear or see anyone else. I remember that. We were messing around most of the day. I don't really remember much about it, but we ended up building a fire at some point. And I was really impressed because he had this flint or something that he used to start it. I'd never seen anyone do that before, so I thought it was pretty cool. I got him to teach me how to do it, and we lit some stuff on fire. Which, looking back, was really stupid, because it was in the middle of fucking summer. And if I remember right, the fire warning was either at yellow or orange. But thankfully, we didn't start anything major. And when it got dark, we sat around and talked about whatever it is 12-year-olds talk about. I don't really remember. What I do remember is that at some point, he looked over my shoulder at the river and asked me if I could see something. The way our camp was set up, we were about 10 feet from the river, and we were at the widest point, so it was probably about 20 feet to the other bank. It gets hot up there in the summer, but the water's still cold, which is important. I look over my shoulder, and I could see something wading into the river on the other side. From where we were, it looked like a deer, but we couldn't really tell because of the fire. I got up to look closer, and I saw a pair of antlers, so I figured it was a buck. But I thought it was weird that it was wading into the water, and it was definitely heading for us. And I asked Nolan what he thought we should do. He's looking at the fire with this weird expression, and he tells me to sit down and shut up. So I do, because I'd never seen him act that way before. He's whispering at me to ignore it, and to just keep talking like we were. But I couldn't think of anything else to say. He was saying something about an episode of some show, but I could hear the deer coming through the water, so I wasn't really paying any attention. And I kept trying to see over his shoulder, but every time I did, he'd sort of hit me on the arm and make me look at him. I wasn't really scared, but I remember I was just sort of confused. But then, I hear the deer come out of the water, and I could kind of make out what it looked like. And I realized it wasn't a deer, because whatever it was was walking on two legs. I started to get up. I was super freaked out, but Nolan just yanked me down and talked louder about this television show. And I could tell he was just as scared as I was, probably even more. He leaned in and poked the fire with a stick. And he whispered that whatever I do, I can't speak to it. I could see it come closer, and it stood right behind Nolan's back. I was about ready to pee my pants, and I think I'd probably have run if I'd been alone. But I didn't want to leave Nolan, so I kept sitting really still and sneaking glances at it. It wasn't that tall, but the way it carried itself was just wrong. Like, its center of balance was screwed up. I can't really describe it, but it was kind of like it kept shifting too far forward. It just stood there behind Nolan for a long time. And eventually, Nolan ran out of things to say. And we just kind of sat there for a second. The fire was making noise. But I thought I could hear this thing talking in a really low voice. I couldn't hear what it was saying and I leaned forward a tiny little bit. And I actually did pee my pants when it leaned forward too. I couldn't see its face, but I saw its eyes. They were cloudy and milky. And if you want to know what they look like, find that scene from Lord of the Rings where Frodo falls into that lake and all the dead people are floating toward him. That's what its eyes looked like. So all I saw were these two white eyes floating above Nolan's head and the really vague shape of the antlers coming out of its head. I don't know what my face looked like, but at exactly the same time, Nolan and I fucking booked it out of there, and we ran non-stop until we got back to the main camp. My pants were covered with pee, so I took them off as we were running and threw them into the bushes. We both stopped once we were in front of my dad's RV, and we couldn't see anything chasing us. 
so we stood there and caught our breath. I asked him what that thing was, but he said he didn't know. He said his grandpa had only warned him that if anything ever came up to him when he was out in the desert, he was never ever supposed to talk to it or listen to anything it had to say. I wanted to know if he heard it talking too, and he said that the only thing he'd been able to understand was, help you. I think we ended up sleeping in the RV with my parents, and the next night, we went back out and didn't see anything. That does remind me in a lot of ways of the Wendigo legend. There's a phrase used to describe it that I think fits perfectly, which is that the Wendigo is the spirit of the lonely places. I know sometimes when I am out in the wilds, where I know there's no one around me for miles and miles, I get this weird kind of craving that I can't really explain. I don't know if it happens to anyone else, but it's this desire to consume. It's not like I crave anything in particular, but more of this weird, distracting hunger that comes from every part of my gut. I also wanted to find out more about the faceless man, if I was able, and found a few similar things. I asked around my circle of friends, and one of them said he was out doing repairs at a park in his area. He saw something kind of like that. We were having dinner in town, five of us including myself. This guy, he was repainting an information booth and heard a man ask him for directions to the nearest campsite. He didn't turn around because he was up on a ladder, but he informed the man that there weren't any campsites nearby, but that if he headed down the road about four miles, he'd find one at another park. He asked if he could be of any other help, but the man said no and thanked him. My friend said he kept painting, but he was listening and never heard the man leave. The second he came up and talked to me, the hairs on my neck stood up, but I wasn't sure why. I just had this really uneasy feeling about the whole thing and I wanted to finish painting and get out of there. I figured maybe part of it was that I couldn't turn around to look at him, but something just felt off. There was also this weird smell floating around even before the guy talked to me, kind of like old period blood. I had looked around to see what was causing it, but I didn't find anything, so I waited for the guy to walk away. But I didn't hear him leave, which made me think he was just standing there and watching me. So I asked again if I could do anything for him, and he didn't answer. I knew he was there though, because I hadn't heard him leave. So I did this awkward turn on the ladder to look down and see what he was doing. Now I admit, it could have just been my brain fucking up. But I swear to you, Russ, for a split second when I turned around, that fucker didn't have a face. Like, he had no face. It was almost concave and totally smooth. And I just about had a fucking heart attack because I couldn't even wrap my brain around what I was seeing. I think I started to say something, but there was this kind of pop inside my head. And suddenly, he was just a normal looking guy. I must have looked weird because he asked me if I was okay. And I was just like, yeah, I'm fine. He asks about the campsite again, and I point to where he has to go. And he's like, I'm not from around here. Can you help me get there? Now, this is when I knew something is really up, because there's no way this guy got out here and didn't know where he was. And for that matter, there's no car around, so how he'd get here in the first place. I said I was sorry, but that I couldn't take him anywhere in a company vehicle. And he's like, please, I really don't know where I am. Can you come with me and help me get there? So now, I'm seriously weirded out, and I start to wonder if this is some kind of ambush or whatever. I told him I could call him a taxi to come out and take him where he wants to go. And I pull out my phone. And he just goes, no, and walks away really quickly. But he doesn't walk out of the park. He walks back into the fucking trees. And now got right in my fucking truck and start to get out of there. Fuck the paint or whatever. I looked in my mirror to see where he was as I was leaving. And he was standing right by the tree line again. 
I don't know how he got there so fast. But this time, I know that fucker didn't have a face. He was just watching me leave. And right before I turned the corner, he took a big step back into the trees. And kind of dissolved, I guess. Maybe it was just dark, so he blended in. But it felt more like he just melted away. Interestingly, right after this guy finished his story, someone else piped up with another one, but with a slightly different twist. You know, actually, I had something sort of weird like that happen a while back. I was out doing some trail scouting, and I was out in the middle of nowhere, figuring out where we were going to have this trail run through. I haven't seen anyone else for probably a good two hours, so I wasn't really paying attention to where I was going. I was just looking at the ground, for the most part. Then, out of nowhere, I crested this little hill and almost ran into this guy. He was older, probably in his 60s, and I started to apologize to him for running into him. And then, I noticed his face. And I probably looked like a complete douchebag because I stopped and just stared at him. It took me a second to figure out what was wrong. But this guy's face was huge. I know that sounds weird, but that's the only way I can describe it. His head wasn't big or anything. It was normal. But the amount of space his face took up was just way too much. Like if you took someone's face and enlarged it all by two times. He doesn't say anything. He just kind of looks at me. And I backed up and was kind of stuttering and saying I was sorry. And I went around him and fucking got out of there and did what I needed to do. The whole time, I kept looking behind me because I was so freaked out that he'd pop up behind me or something. I know it sounds ridiculous, but I swear to you, it was one of the creepiest things I've ever seen. I switched the topic to the stairs a little later, and there was a definite shift in enthusiasm. No one spoke up at first. There is a real stigma around discussing them, even when we're away from work. But I broke the ice with a story of my own, and the guy who told the story about the faceless man told this one, albeit very quietly. Couple years ago, I was camping with my girlfriend, and we were about two miles from the road at this site I know. We went to bed that night, but we couldn't sleep because. Someone interjected a funny comment, and we were dangerously close to going off on another subject. But I got us back on track. Yeah, really funny, you fucker. No, it was because we kept hearing that grinding noise. My brother used to grind his teeth in his sleep, and it kind of reminds me of that. My girlfriend was freaking out, but I just kept telling her to ignore it. Because I've heard it before, and you just have to ignore it. It goes away eventually. You guys know what I mean. We all knew what he meant. So eventually, I got her to go to sleep. But I woke up probably two hours later because something was just off. I rolled over and she wasn't there and I kind of freaked out because. He thought for a second and then took a very long drink. Anyway, I ran out of the tent calling her name, but I didn't have to go far. She was standing at the edge of the camp looking at something in the trees. And I could see she was really pale. The fire was low but bright enough to see her. Anyway, so I ran up to see what was going on, and she was dead asleep, but her eyes were wide open. She had this real spaced out look, you know. So I put my arm around her to lead her back, but she wouldn't move. She just said really quietly, something like, I have to go now, Eddie. I have to go. It's here. I was like, you're just sleepwalking. Come back to bed. But she wouldn't budge. She just kept standing there and saying that she had to go. And I looked where she was looking. And there was a fucking staircase right there, about 15 yards away. Gray one. Concrete. And she started to walk toward it. But I yanked her back. And that woke her up. She looked at me like I was fucking out of my mind. And she asked what the fuck she was doing out of the tent. I didn't tell her anything, 
I just told her she was sleepwalking. The grinding was gone, so she just went back to the tent with me and fell asleep again. I don't know. I don't like thinking about it, you know. We all knew. You guys remember that kid with, I can't remember what it was, some kind of brain fuck up? Not Downs, but something like it. Someone else brought up. Well, I got to read the report he gave when they found him a week after he went missing, and it was fucked up beyond belief. I mean, you have to take it with a grain of salt, because who knows what that kid actually thinks is real. But some of this stuff, I don't think he could have made up. Like what? Well, first of all, he talked about the stairs. He said he'd been watching his dad build a fire, and the stairs came up to him, and he had to go up them, or something bad would happen. The cops couldn't really understand what he was talking about after that, because he just kept saying, like the campfire, over and over, and he kept mentioning sounds, but he couldn't say what sounds. Just that it was loud, and he covered his ears so he couldn't hear them. But the thing I remember most is that they asked him where exactly he'd gone. And he just said he was right there. He kept pointing at himself, and they said they thought that meant that he thought he'd never left. He said he wasn't scared because the stairs were there. And he said they talked to him, but not like people talk. Like I said, It was really convoluted and hard to understand. And I have a feeling the cops didn't take most of it down. They ended up just saying that the kid had some kind of amnesia or fuke. And that they didn't think foul play was involved. Doesn't really explain why he came back a week later, perfectly fine, without a speck of dirt on him, and well fed. But hey, what the cops say goes. There's still a lot of questions I want to answer. I'll continue to ask around and find out whatever I can. The next update should be soon. Thanks for being so patient. This will be my final update for now. Things have deteriorated here to a degree that I didn't foresee. I didn't know how much writing about the things that are happening out here would affect every single part of my life. And maybe that was stupid of me. Maybe I should have considered it more seriously. But honestly, I just thought I was writing about things that a few people would want to hear. I didn't think it would get this much attention. People ask me about the stairs now. It doesn't happen every day. But when it does happen, I never really know what to say. My bosses know someone is talking about them. And I'm sure that if they know, the higher-ups know. And I can tell you that they aren't happy about it. I've been formally told that I am not to speak a word about them to anyone anymore, which is part of the reason this has to be my final update. I can't risk my job for this. As much as it's been wonderful to get a lot of these things off my mind, I still do love my work, and I need to be out here. If anything, being aware of what's really going on is enough reason to stick it out. I may not be able to tell people that they're out there, but if I see them... I can direct traffic away to somewhere safer. Because of the amount of attention the stories have gotten, I've heard a lot of stories being swapped back and forth. I've heard so many, I can't even remember most of them. The ones I do remember are the ones that I wish I could forget. One story that's made the rounds here was about a young woman who disappeared upstate. Initially, everyone assumed she was a runaway. She didn't come from a great home life, And so it really wasn't any kind of surprise that she'd choose to cut and run. But people started coming forward saying that they'd seen her around the park shortly before she vanished. So some of the rangers in the area were sent out to make sure she hadn't hung herself or something on any of the back trails. It took them a while. But they did find her. Well, not all of her. Just half of her tongue in a quarter of the lower jaw. Very clean cuts, from what I heard. They've never found the rest of her. So many stories about children. So many of them going missing and turning up in caves, wedged in between impossibly tight spaces. So many of them found on mountain peaks, or at the bottoms of sheer gullies, 
missing shoes, missing socks, or found with both in perfect condition despite them being miles and miles away from where they had vanished. So many stories of black-eyed people wandering around the woods and calling out in the night, mimicking the sound of running water or a bobcat screaming. One man in particular goes to every news station he thinks will listen to him and tells the same story. He was deer hunting, had camped out in a very remote area, and woke up because something was scraping against his tent. He thought it was a raccoon or a fox until the thing pressed its face against the door of the tent. At which point, he could very clearly make out a human nose and mouth. He kicked at it, but it leapt back and was gone by the time he opened the tent flap. Gun at his side, he fired two warning shots. And when the sound had faded, he heard a snap behind him. A man was standing at the edge of the campsite. The man was not wearing any clothing, but he also didn't possess any kind of human flesh. As this hunter described it, the man was made of some kind of amalgamation of raw meat and hair, as if someone had scooped up roadkill and molded it into the fake shape of a man. The face was lumpy, and only a rough approximation of a human face. The thing opened its lopsided mouth, and from it came the sound of the gun the hunter had fired. It did this twice before mimicking the sound of the tent zipper and fleeing into the night. A young couple out for a hike in the rocky areas of my park reported to me yesterday that they had seen something strange out on a peak I'm very familiar with. They were taking turns looking through a pair of binoculars when the men noticed the hiker climbing up a very steep part of the cliff face. He watched the men scale the slope, and it didn't occur to him until the incident was over that this person had no climbing gear. When the climber reached the top of the peak, which was about five miles away, they turned and faced the young man. He said whoever or whatever this person was, was looking right at them. The climber waved in an exaggerated manner, before snapping in half at the waist, sideways, and leaping off the peak. The young man didn't see where the climber landed. I sent them on their way with assurances that I'd check it out. I lied. I won't be turning in a report. Because there are ten others exactly like it. The climber is well known in that area. I don't question it anymore. There are so many things I won't ever be able to understand about my job. And it would take me years to relate all of the things I've heard in the last few months. When I feel like my job isn't in jeopardy, I will come back. It may be in a different format, but I will come back. Thank you all for sticking by my side and enjoying the things I've talked about. If you go out into the woods, I encourage you to be safe. Bring water, food, survival equipment. Let people know where you're going and when you'll be back. Don't go on uncharted paths unless you know exactly what you're doing. And above all, don't touch them. Don't look at them. Don't. Go up them. <laughs>